Right. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so welcome to the, the last of this uh, series of talks. Um, so today is a little bit different, as I mentioned. Um, we're going to start with the uh, more tablet stuff. And then the second part, I want to turn into kind of a mini seminar on work in my group. bunch of noisy measurements of the system and you want to infer the state of the system at the present time in order to be able to control it, for example. Um, and we came up with a solution called the common filter for linear dynamics um, where we made use of this observer structure um, that uh, uh, we've been talking about where the the idea is to find a parallel dynamical system. So you have your physical system. We assume that we know it, and that's important. And then we're coupling the two models, the, the frequency between the actual observations and the observations, something we're calling the innovations. Um, and based on those innovations, we can construct feedback that would synchronize it, and then we can take the state from the uh, synchronized, synchronized system. Um, and this is something that works quite well. What I want to do for the first part is to kind of go back and, and more or less rederive the common filter and things like that, but from a more general point of view that equation analysis um, and points the way to generalizing this. First of all, giving a deeper understanding of where this common filter is coming, why does it have the structure it does, and also um, uh, pointing the way to how to generalize it for more complicated situations. Okay, so um, uh, so 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 let's let's get started on it. Um, the so the, the topic is the Bayesian version or formulation of state estimation. So state estimation is this general problem of, of uh, estimating a hidden, sometimes called latent state from some kinds of observations. And I should say this, this comes up in many, many contexts uh, having to do with physics or dynamical systems. Um, the, 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 some of the techniques that I'll talk about were developed actually for speech recognition by computer. So you, you have the audio signaling the hidden states of the words that are being spoken. Um, and it, it's used in all over machine learning. Okay, um, so one, one change in perspective is that the common filter, you remember what we got to last time was a set of equations, kind of complicated looking set of equations that were describing the mean and covariances of the states that we were trying to estimate. I think I didn't emphasize the covariance part enough because one of the things that's nice about the common filter is that not only is it estimating the state, it's estimating the confidence that one has in that state by via the covariance matrix. Um, so you're getting not only, this, these are the P matrices that I kept talking about. So those tell you how certain you are about the estimates um, and, and that kind of, um, check on, on sort of what your estimates are like is always a nice thing to have for an estimate, not only to have a number, but to have a, a, some kind of uncertainty. Um, and, and our point of view is shift from that kind of language to the language of probability density functions. And so, um, you know, if you have a, a Gaussian distribution, then it's characterized by a mean covariance. But more generally, you could have just some funky distribution that had some different shape. And, and that's, that's kind of where we'll be going today. OK, so um, let's start with a, a toy model of just one noisy measurement. And 
Um, so we have, this is, this is the kind of measurement relationship that we've been talking about in, in time, but let's just imagine one measurement and that's all we have. Um, and so we, we observe Y and we want to infer X. And in one of the things that the Bayesian formulation, I'm, I'm sort of assuming that people have, I mean, we talked about, I think, I think other people talked about this in the course and that people have at least seen some of the Bayesian formulations. Is that, is that right? Okay, there's, there's the whole story about different interpretations of probability of frequencies versus degree. Okay, so I can, we'll, we'll start with a, a certain, and, and, and so one of the important parts of the Bayesian story is, is um, how to incorporate prior knowledge about the variable you're trying to make estimates on. And in this case, for example, we can say that, well, maybe our prior knowledge, just for this toy example, is that we're trying to measure X, which is something that on average is zero and has an uncertainty of sigma X and, and is described by a galaxy distribution. Um, on the other hand, our measurement noise is also, and Bayes' theorem will tell us kind of how to, how to deal with this situation. So um, remember that the joint probability of X and Y can be factored either as conditional probability of X given Y times P of Y uh, or P of Y given X, P of X. And, and rearranging this gives us Bayes' theorem, which in this case here says that the uh, X after or when we incorporate the uh, Y and uh, P of Y gives us uh, known as the likelihood times P of X, which is the, the, the prior. And then there's a normalizing constant P of Y, which is called the evidence, but, but often is calculated just as something to make sure that this is, this is a, a bona fide probability density function that integrates to one. Okay, um, so neglecting that, that normalization for the moment, then our inference, which is P of X given Y. So, so, so we have the thing that we're interested in X, we make a measurement Y. And so this allows us to say, you know, what do we know? And it's relating it to things that we can calculate, which is P of Y given X, this is the likelihood you know, given that it's actually at some definite position X, um, what is the likelihood of getting an observation Y spread about it? And then there's our prior P of X, which is what we know about X without incorporating this measurement Y. Okay, so in this particular case, um, we know that, that these are both Gaussian distributions. Um, the, um, the first one, the likelihood is um, our, our noise, Remember variable here. So y minus x is just c, um, and so this is this is our noise distribution. How much is y is distributed by x, and then this is our prior. And so these are just Gaussian distributions. And again, neglecting the normalization constants are just the uh, product of two two. Uh, so that's just the sum of the exponent. And so you can you can combine this and this, add these two and rearrange it uh, to complete the factor that comes out. And what you find is another Gaussian distribution. And it has a non-zero mean given in, which is shown in blue and a new variance of uh, 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 sigma naught squared, which is related to the original variances as, as follows. Um, so the, the posterior, then what you know about X is, is, is another Gaussian. Um, the mean is sigma X squared over sigma X squared plus sigma zeta squared Y. So it's somewhere in between where you would put the part, put, put, put the state X without a measurement, which is somewhere around zero and the measurement. And because we have uh, some prior information about what X should be, we're not, we, we don't just naively trust the measurement, which would be the likelihood uh, which would just be the likelihood function, um, we kind of correct it by this prior knowledge that we have about what X should be. Okay, it's, it's I had to say, it's one of these things where the, the, the mathematics is very simple, but, but the ideas behind it take, take some thinking to, to, to do. 
Okay. So, so um, any, any questions on? Uh, I mean, how, um, how would you refer the uh, standard deviations to your black I mean, This is a given thing. That you're <laughs> no, no, no. Well, okay. So, 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 uh, yeah. The, the 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 likelihood. So, so, so we're we're starting sort of assuming that that these are things that we have determined. So, how would you determine the noise? Well, you could you could just you know. I mean, in the lab, if you're trying to measure variable quantity, you try to fix the quantity, you do repeated measurements and, okay, you know, look at the histogram and see if it's a Gaussian and what's the standard deviation. Um, the prior knowledge on X could come from many things. Uh, theory, for example, no theory. Yeah, it could come from theory uh, um, or a mix of theory and empirical that, that, for example, if I have a particle trapped in optical tweezers and I, you know, then, then, then from theory, we expect a Gaussian distribution yeah. about the center of the trap. Of course, there's, do we know where the center of the trap is? That might be a little bit experimental. So um, okay. here, here we're just sort of sweeping those questions under the rug and saying, okay, in terms of, of, of these distributions that somehow we, we've mm -hmm. already determined. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is that the new um, uh, uh, Gaussian is actually narrower in width than either of the two previous Things. Okay. Okay. You know, it obeys this relationship. Uh, notice that if these uncertainties is huge, you just get the other one has extreme uncertainty. You're still limited by the other, you know, sort of saved by the other one. But in the case where there are, um, for example, all equal uncertainties, then this would be uh, a factor of two smaller. This antivision would go down by a factor of square root of two. Uh, but it's always a, 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 at least a little bit somewhat uh, smaller. Okay, so so this is this is a very simple test case, but it's one to kind of keep in mind as 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 things get a little more complicated. So the situation that that um, I want to think about is um, a um, this is really supposed to be just make sure this is really X here um, a dynamical system which in, at least in discrete time would be evolving between uh, uh, time step k minus one, k, k plus one. So this is the, the x's that, that evolve according to some internal dynamics. And at each time point, k, or k plus one and so forth, um, there's an observation uh, y associated with it. So y k minus one, y k, y k plus one. So we can give this kind of a very simple graphical structure here. Um, and so, uh, uh, if the X's are some kind of uh, Markov process, and for example, if the X's were discrete, we would say that we have a, um, uh, a hidden Markov model in the sense that if the X's are a Markov model and we're, we have the Y's that we're observing, then we might want to infer the X's given the sequence of Y's. Okay, which, and of course the Y's are non markov uh, So, um, uh, but, but here it's slightly different. These X's are dynamical systems. And, um, uh, and so the dynamics are evolving. These are discretized dynamics of a continuous dynamical system, but, but punctuated with, with uh, uh, um, instantaneous observations. Um, this is just one setting, of course. There are, there are cases where um, the observations are also some kind of continuous process. Like if you have an analog needle going up and the observations could be a continuous process and then we'd have two continuous processes and that's a little more complicated. Uh, kind of describe this, this situation. Well, if we start with the state X1 at, at the beginning and it's initially distributed according to some probability density function, then the kinds of dynamics that we'll be thinking about are, um, uh, uh, xk plus one will be prob some probability density function of xk plus one given xk. So in this formalism, it's a conditional probability, which um, we'll talk about more. The yk will be um, given that the system is in some state xk, um, then there'll be a range of that are sort of emitted or measured. Um, the, the statement about Markovian dynamics 
Um, okay, so, so, so my notation for a sequence here um, might be different from some, but I, I, I kind of like it. Um, so it's, I'll say X upper K is the set of X1, X2, X3, all the way up to XK. So it's just the collection of X's up to XK. Um, and similarly, YK will be the collections of Y up to YK. And so in general, um, the dynamics um, could be a function of um, a, a K, you know, the state at X K, at time K plus one could depend on all of the XKs before and perhaps even the YKs if there's any feedback. Um, and we'll say that no, in fact, if, 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 if we give it XK, if we know the state at time K, then we'll know at least the range of outcomes for K plus one. And it doesn't care what XK minus one was or any of the previous observations and so forth. Okay, um, likewise, the observations in principle could depend on uh, prior states and all of the prior observations and so forth. And again, we'll assume that. Yeah. So, so the first, uh, you know, the 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 the, the first the, the, these two assumptions basically mean that there's no memory and no dynamics to the observation. And again, physically, this is an assumption process. So. Um, in, in, in the kinds of experiments I'll be talking about in a moment, the, um, you know, we have a particle moving around in a fluid and we make observations by shining light on it and not exactly taking a picture, but, but recording the position according to some electronic yeah. detector and circuit. Yeah. And, and in some sense, we're just saying, well, those dynamics of whatever's happening there are fast enough that it just gives the, an instantaneous uh, measurement. Um, Sorry, but it, it, uh, when you measure, you are not altering the system. So. And you're assuming that you're not altering the system. Yeah. yeah. So again, these, you know, of course, if you're doing a quantum mechanical measurement, um, that you could. Um, sometimes people think that that defines quantum mechanical measurements, but that's not true. So there are plenty of classical measurements that disturb the system as well. Um, for example, I, I could, you know, you know, photonics, for example. So, Photonic things, no? Photonic. Yeah, well, I was gonna say that seems unclassable, but I could, I could on a larger scale, um, you know, uh, 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 make, you know, sound wave, like, like in, in, in geophysics, people explode. Explosions and then the sound waves go down and they reflect off things. Or you could imagine like a little, um, well, yeah, a, 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 a little robot that goes and searches something and when it finds it, it explodes. So it destroys the system, but you know where it was. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's nothing quantum mechanical, um, how do you say, the, the only thing quantum mechanical about the disturbing
So, so, so we take p of x k plus one and x k given the y k's, and then we decompose it like this. This should be also a function of the y k's, but because it's Markovian, it, it, it isn't. And then, and then we're left with the, the p of x k given the y k's. Um, and um, and so now. Uh, uh, now we'll make an assumption about the dynamics that are xk plus ones are some nonlinear function of xk uk, but also now a noise process. So this is something that we'll, we'll, we'll add to the description. Um, and, um, and we can express um, p of xk given xk plus one given xk in terms of this uh, um, uh, uh, function as follows. Um, where we, we first write, um, we, we marginalize, so we introduce um, P of XK and so we integrate over it. So this is, this is uh, something we're always allowed to do. So this is, this is one of the standard tricks in this business where you, you, you introduce a joint probability and you know, by, by integrating over it um, as follows and then decompose it into conditional probabilities. So um, we, uh, decompose this into p of xk plus one given xk and the, and the new k. Um, so we're just putting here times p of new k given xk. New k is the noise, so it's not dependent on the xk. So we can go from here to here. This guy here, p of xk plus one, given the state and the noise is deterministic. Okay, so um, xk plus one is um, in some sense, it's a stochastic dynamics because it depends on this random variable new k, which will be like the thermal noise in, in, in our system that we were talking about before. Um, but if I but if somebody tells you what the value of the thermal noise is, it's a deterministic function of that noise. Okay, so this means that that in this uh, um, relation, this is this is actually a deterministic relation, which means the delta function distribution of xk plus one minus f of xk uk and nu k. All right. Um, and then this is just p of k. And so this is the, um, the, the, the xk plus one given xk is just the noise distribution where nu k is what solves this relationship. I know. So we are saying that the probability of measuring xk plus one given xk is the probability of the, the noise that would have pro, uh, produced this value of x take as one, right? It's like- Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in the simple case of additive noise, this will just be the, 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 the distribution, for example, of Gaussian noise is placed around the x yeah. value. It's what, it's what I did kind of in the toy model, but we can see here where it's coming from. Um, Sorry, so this is the first state. So, the, so this tells us kind of, I mean, we can just leave this as is, okay, but this is just telling us in, in a case where we know what the dynamics is, how to actually kind of connect this to things that we can calculate. Okay. Um, the second step of all of this story is the update. So um, here we use... Uh, Uh, Bayes' rule. So we want the prediction. And so this is, um, we, we, we turn this around. Um, so we're going to do this just for the quantity. So, so, okay, notation here is a little compact, but this is all the yk's from yk plus one, yk, yk minus one, all the way down to y1. Um, 
Okay. But I'm going to be interested in this the single value y lower k plus one. That's the single measurement at time k plus one. Why k upper one is the collection of measurements going from the, from now back into the past. Okay. So I, I isolate in 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 the likelihood the lower just the, the this single measurement p of y k. What's left are y upper k, all the rest of them, and it's given uh, x k plus one. So I'm, I'm switch, you know, this is really being written as y k plus one comma y k, I guess. Um, so doing that, and then I've got a normalization, and then this is the the prior here. So again, um, so so so. Um, we then look at this thing here, and it looks like a, a, a big mess, except that we remember that the observation is only dependent on state xk plus one. So all of this stuff here is it because you have to distribution of the, of the system, and you have the dynamics for, for the system. So I have a prior estimate of the state given all of the measurements. Okay. Okay. And so I'm decomposing it into two steps. So I so I start at time k, and I have because this is a recursive argument. I have an estimate of x at time k given the y's from time k back into the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now I'm going to do two things: using that estimate and knowing the dynamics. I'm going to say, how does that xk evolve to an xk plus one in the absence of any measurements? Okay, and so it's just, you know, it's it's Markovian dynamics. So if you have a state xk, you can evolve it to xk plus one somehow. And we just talked about how that might look. Um, so that's step one. Mm -hmm. And then at time k plus one, all of a sudden another measurement comes in. Okay, okay. and so now all I'm doing, you know, with the fancy notation is updating the probability, you know, at probability density for P of X K plus one, and that's the prediction given all the Y Ks. Now I get a new piece of information and I just want to update that using base theorem. Okay. Okay. So that's all. So it's just two steps, but you see that once I've done that, or once we've done that, then we have an estimate of X at time K plus one, given all the Y's at time K plus one. And so we've, re we've completed the recursion sort of task. But you couldn't like, maybe it's, it's, it's not like, but I don't know if you understand it. Like you couldn't just take the last measure you did and evolve the dynamics like to solve the focal plug equation you have or the stochastic differential equations. Well, that's kind of what we're doing, but just carefully. Okay. So, so it's really easy to by solving for the, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean the why is it not no, no, no. It's like the thing is the Ys themselves don't really have a dynamics, right? In the sense of, you know, um, you, you, or, or it has a dynamics, but it's not Markovian. So the YK does not tell you how to get to YK plus one. No, knowing like the distribution of YK doesn't tell you how to, right? I guess you need, need a, a bunch of past measurements. My question is like, we are trying to determine the distribution of possible states that are important. Yes. And it's like, Okay, but when you measured, you are sorry. Yeah, I have to think about it. Maybe but when you measure, you are, you are saying what is the state? Like that, the state. But it's but it's a noisy measurement, and it's not all the state. It's only one num one noisy number, mm -hmm. and you have an n-dimensional state. So it's not telling you the state in okay. itself. Okay, it's only as we've seen, you can only learn the state by incorporating past measurements. Okay, so this is, yeah, I mean, how to say, we, we, we've tried to approach this in several ways with the observer system and the you know, two classical systems, no, 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 two deterministic systems, and they kind of just evolve and kind of synchronize. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then we went to um, kind of the, 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 the Kalman version, which was just an observer in discrete, well, in discrete or continuous times, but with a, a rational way to choose the feedback coupling between the two. Now we're trying to kind of give it a Bayesian spin. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was also a question that. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, how do I? Uh, which which one is? This one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, do I get trans? Uh, 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 yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so so the new. Um, let's see. Okay, there's nothing. For some reason, there's, there's okay. Um, yeah, so, um, right, so, 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 uh, so we use Bayes for just the, the, um, uh, casting likelihood here, um, uh, using measurements and then, and then the fact that it's independent of the, the Y's. And so, um, this then, um, and then we add a normalization constant, uh, the normalization constant is just integrating over all the possible intermediate states uh, x k plus one um, and and can be rewritten as y k plus one given all the previous y k. Uh, okay, so um, if we put it all together, um, we get this collection of equations. So um, this allows us to predict x k plus one given all the y k's and using a previous estimate. Okay, so we go, we start from XK given all the YKs. We use this Mar Markovian dynamics rule to evolve the XK to XK plus one, integrating over all the possible XKs that can, 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 can be present here. Um, we then use Bayes to update from XK plus one given YK to YK plus one. Okay, and so we have our, our likelihood and and this, this this serves as our prior, and then we have the likelihood. These relationships will be using x k plus one as some function of x k u k u k, and the y k's are some other function of this. Actually, it's, it's it's a lot simpler if if the f has additive noise structure, as I've said. Even even if the the noise can be multiplicative noise. Um, if, it's, if, it, if it's adding onto the structure that, that simplifies the solution of new given, given the x's. Um, and, and in a case like this, then you can, you, know, you, can, you can actually solve the continuous time dynamics with the Fokker Planck equation for the distribution. So we know how, I mean, this is a separate story in statistical physics, but if you have a, a stochastic dynamical system with a described by a probability density P of x, and subject to, to um, known dynamics and known diffusive noise processes, then, then we know how to describe the evolution of that for the prediction. So the prediction can come um, either by making discretized dynamics and evolving them according to some discrete jump rule, or perhaps more carefully using the Fokker Planck equation and just integrating it in continuous time from time k to k plus one and so on. Um, and you know you get uh, uh, effects where the, the deterministic parts will move. You know, for example, a constant force will just move a probability density function to make it drift in one direction. If the force is space dependent, then different parts of the density will drift at different rates. So you can get some stretching or compression. But that's all determined by the by the um, deterministic part of the dynamics. And then if there's um, noise terms, they'll make it. You know, they, 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 they add a diffusive influence so that distributions tend to move out. Again, the noise could be state dependent so that the rate of diffusion depends on where the system is. Okay, and, and when you do, when you have multiplicative noise, there's all sorts of subtleties that, that, that people like Rob 
they all understand better than I do. And uh, uh, so, okay. We're not gonna be really focusing on that kind of complicated situation. So the next step is to connect this to what we did yesterday with the Kalman filter. And I'll do this in a kind of approximate way because the, the, the full story is a little bit gory in algebra, but, but just to give a, a sense. So we have the specific model that we use for evolving is now a linear one. The observations are linear observations and we still have our noise terms in, in the two cases. Um, the um, quantities like P of X, K plus one, given YK um, in, in the language that we had yesterday would be a Gaussian distribution. So, so in the common filter, what we'll be leaning on is, I guess you could call it theorem, or it's, just, it's, it's, it's a fairly clear statement that if you have a, a, um, if you have a Gaussian distribution and you um, multiply it by some you know, distribution for some quantity X, if you add a number to it, and if you multiply the x by some scale, it's still a Gaussian distribution, just the change in mean and variance and so forth. Um, so that's in a sense all we do here. Like if you think about like if if nu k is a Gaussian distribution, u k is deterministic, and if the x k's were Gaussian, then x k plus one is also going to be Gaussian. The, the probability densities of, of something as it goes through this relationship, and same thing here. So the special feature about linear dynamics and, and Gaussian noise is that the distribution probability density describing all of these quantities always stays Gaussian. And we know that a Gaussian is just characterized by a mean and a covariance matrix. And so that's all we need to do is, is find these. So in the language we had yesterday, um, this would be a, a, a Gaussian distribution uh, for the variable x k plus one with mean x k x hat k plus one minus and p k plus one minus the minus was for the prediction quantities. Um, the observations would be uh, y k plus one minus c x k plus one given a covariance matrix q c um, and and so on. So all of these quantities that enter in, we can assign names uh, that we had yesterday. And, and basically the step that I'm not going to attempt to do is to just stick all these quantities in and show that the same recursion relations, uh, this sort of condition on Gaussian, you know, if you have a joint uh, bivariate um, Gaussian distribution and, and you condition on say one of those variables, what's the distribution for the, for the conditional distribution and so forth. So you always get Gaussian distributions, but the calculations of what the mean and covariances are is, is a little bit complicated. And so um, I guess at this point, I'll just say that when you, when you do that, you, you, you in fact reproduce the, the, um, the common filter, but it's a calculation you really have to kind of go through on your own or, or with the help preferably of something like Mathematica or Maple to convince you that it really is is working out. There's a lot of kind of completing the squares in it and, and, and you know, tricks like that. Um, so, um, so one moment, uh, John. So uh, only when you have Gaussian noise and linear dynamics, both are equivalent. Both, uh, no, no, you need both, you need, you need both the uh, features. So everything, so for the counter filter to work and for this to reduce to something solvable, easily solvable, the dynamics have to be linear. All the noise distributions have to be Gaussian. And in particular, for example, the, the uncertainty in the state initially should be Gaussian. Okay. Okay, so you start with Gaussian distributions and the linearity means that everything will always be just <laughs> multiplied and translated and stay Gaussian. So for example, if I work with my optical physics setup, I can use to pick up whatever I want, Gauss, uh, base uh, filter or canon filter, right? Well, the, the, so, so the base filter that we've just been describing is a general set of equations. Yes. Okay. 
will work for anything. Yes. If you what the general equations are, then there's another story. You can solve them and you get the common filter under the condition that, that the dynamics are linear and the, the noises are um, Gaussian. So all the noise distributions are Gaussian. So, yeah. I also have a question. Um, the, I think the common filter in the way in the way we introduce it kind of hinges on this definition of the update with the derivations. Um, and also the equivalent, it's equivalence with the Bayesian uh, formula. This update rule seems to me like a very smart choice, but it also seems kind of arbitrary. Is there, how do we know that this is the proper way of doing the update and not some kind of different like function of the innovations? Um, well, so in, in, in the matrix, so, so here I think, I mean, this is just using base. There isn't really too much latitude in it. I agree. <laughs> Uh, so, 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 so these are these are kind of definitions in some sense because they're defining these kinds of quantities. Okay, but now you have to stick them into these formulas and make relationships among them, and then you see that this relationship just comes out of the algebra. Okay, so it's just coming out of the whole, the whole structure that we kind of assumed in a somewhat arbitrary way is what comes out of this this Bayesian formula. Which way did it go? Well, historically, the big Kalman came first, yeah. and Bayes actually not, not very long after, a few years after. The Kalman was somehow lucky that he chose the right. I mean, it, it seems very really smart way to do that. Very logical to do that. So, yeah. Um, but theoretically, the computer came out of the computer was not At that time, no, but, 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 it's, but, but now you can essentially yeah, uh, prove course, that this is. Course. The, the right thing, and, and so um, similarly in the um, in the LQR calculation of, of, of regulating something, um, there was a step where I assumed that the input should be some matrix.
that is the noise of the well, characterize the autocorrelation of the, I mean, characterize the noise, but then characterize the common filter by asking, you know, are these predictions um, independent? Because the idea is sort of that your, your, your predictions have extracted every possible piece of information about the system, right? Mm -hmm. that, that you're predicting it basically up to the measurement noise in some mm -hmm. sense. And if there are any correlations between them um, or any offset, like if, you, you know, if, if, you're, if your predicted observations are always too high or if they're always too correlated in, in time, then that means something is wrong. And there's some piece of information about the system that you haven't extracted. Um, that means that your predictions are kind of systematically not as good as they should be. You can stop. Okay. Oh, do I have to join the meeting? Yes. yes. Okay. And also a quick question. If, if yeah, you want. just a second. Let me, let me just get this started. Uh, um, join. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you are doing like this update process, recursive process, you are supposed that you are doing instantaneously, right? I mean, instantaneously. Um, while you are observing the processes that it's observing, yeah. You, you measure, you calculate some things, and you predict at the same time, right? Yeah, so this is this is still a kind of idealized way of proceeding where, yes, the, the, the measurement transfer to the computer calculation than the k to k plus one time. Um, I'm about to talk to you about an experiment where that's not true and, and I'll, I'll Yeah, but we are doing I, I, like what I mean by okay. Oh, It was um. All right, are we back? No, maybe. No, because you are, you have to. Well, tell you what, you know, I, I'm sort of. Oh, 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 okay. No, are you muted? All right. Okay, I was going to say, I mean, we're, we're pretty much getting to the end of what I wanted to say here. Um, maybe, maybe given the. The time and stuff. Let me let me just uh, say what <laughs> what else was I going to talk about um, on on this before going. Um, two just two quick points. One is um, why do we, um, we 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 have a Gaussian and we characterize the, 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 the x hat is sort of a single number actually the, the conditional mean and you can you can show that this is in a sense, something that minimizes um, uh, the the you know yeah why why do we choose x x hat as the, the 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 as the representative value and so the idea is that if we um, uh, are interested in some p of x given y and we're using Bayes relationship to estimate it then if we form as a cost function the um, average value, the expected value of uh, the deviation 
of whatever whatever particular x is involved from our x hat that we're choosing and we square that deviation and look at the ensemble average or the expectation that um, if we if we define this as our, our kind of cost function that by choosing x hat um, as the conditional mean you minimize this of course this function is a little bit arbitrary we could have for example uh, uh, use the absolute value and then you would get an l1 uh, you know that's like an l1 and then you would get uh, uh, the median, I think. The mean deviation, I think. Sorry? Mean deviation. I think I think it's the mean. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's different. The point is this is this is this is a little arbitrary, but given that then this is this is what you would use. Um, the other comment was that uh, um, you know uh, this this Bayesian formalism allows a way to kind of go beyond uh, uh, linear dynamics and linear noise. And so then the question is sort of um, you know what what to do and the, the, there are perturbative approaches which try to tweak the approach a little bit, but make it like a Kalman filter with a bit of extra stuff. And then there are kind of strongly different, strongly nonlinear dynamics, strongly non Gaussian noise, where you might resort to some kind of numerical solution. If you do a numerical solution, you can either try to solve them as a set of uh, um, uh, equations like on a, on a grid or a basis expanding over basis functions. It's also possible to try to do Monte Carlo uh, representations. Um, in the perturbative approaches, um, the, the basic one is called an extended Kalman filter, and you basically just sort of you know use the nonlinear rule to propagate the mean, which is a little bit of an approximation, but then always kind of make assume that it's Gaussian at each step. And just characterize it by the mean and, and, and variance, even though that's not really true. But if it's not too far off, it's not too bad a, a thing to do. Um, then your ensemble method is kind of like a sampling method um, where you construct empirical uh, covariances, but sampling from the true distribution. So there's 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 a whole slew <coughs> of approaches, and, and many many like like different approaches work better for different kinds of problems, and different fields have different kinds of problems. So. If you come from meteorology, for example, the ensemble Kalman filter and, and geophysics, it's very popular because it's good for high dimensional state spaces. Um, extended Kalman filter was used in the, the space program, you know, in the 1960s, you know, Apollo, that was sort of the basis for navigation of, of, of satellites and Apollo missions and things to the moon and things like that. Um, but we don't need any of that fancy stuff. Mm. Um, as I said, the goal was to kind of show that this um, common filter, although it has a seemingly arbitrary structure, comes is is kind of like the expression of of, of Bayesian um, reasoning in the context of these dynamic systems with Markovian dynamics. Okay, so um, I was going to stop and change gears into seminar mode. But are there any are any questions on, on this stuff before we can switch? Okay, so I'm going to shut this down. So don't panic on the internet. And <laughs> okay, so let's see. So I just stop. Let's see. I guess I let me let me just uh, go back to the thing and stop sharing and all that. Uh, and I will leave. The meeting here. And um, one, well, I have a little question. Uh, there are big differences uh, uh, to apply the optimal control theory with base estimation instead of karma. Uh, no. Well, no. This remember these are these are these are separate stories. So it's so true, true. so so optimal control is is how do you pick the u um, in the best way? I mean, best way. Yeah, you know, given an initial state x. How do I pick a U that, that gets me somewhere into the future? Um, this state estimation is given the observations in the past. Predict. Well, well, either, yeah, uh, how, how, how to reconstruct the state at this time, or, and we'll do this in a moment, you can also use it to predict into the future. Like it's done by a series of prediction and update steps. Okay, now. How do I do this? I want to go to Zoom. Usually I do this to 
No, this is to SF using. I just, I just do general Zoom, I guess, right? Okay, join a meeting. Yeah. Okay, if somebody has that ID here, Andy. Oh, no, I did it once, so, so we tested this one. Sorry, I, that, that I have. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, I should be able to do this. 
plants and thereby developing a temperature difference that can be used to extract work. Um, so this is this is this is nice, but not so practical, uh, at least to do it in 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 this way. Um, right, it's not going to have to do this. So in, in 1929, uh, uh, Leo Zubard proposed a, 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 a nice simplification of this, where it's sufficient to look at one particle in in a box, and you could insert a partition. And now it's either on one side or the other. And if you make a measurement, um, you can attach a kind of pulley and let this one particle gas uh, uh, exert a force as it expands. Um, it uh, uh, does some work lifting up a mass. And um, the particle stays at the same average energy because the walls are at some temperature. So it's connected to a thermal bath. Um, and when you do this, you can show that, and, and I guess one did, that you can extract up to KT log two um, of, of work per cycle. So once one through over here, we have a cycle and we can go and reinsert a partition and so forth. Um, so this is closer to uh, what, what we're going to do, but um, still slightly different. Um, we have a kind of modern version of this that can, can, can and has been built. Um, and uh, I, I want to explore what this sort of new type of engine which is extracting work from, from Bath can actually do. Um, and uh, if we have time and stamina, we might talk a little bit about the costs of erasure and Landauer's principle and so forth. But I think that the part I want to really focus on is this, this first part. Okay, so imagine a um, particle that's got a mass M, it's heavy, there's gravity, and it's hanging from a spring, uh, hanging from, from a support via a spring. And because it's small, it's fluctuating up and down with enough amplitude that we can, we can measure and see its, its, its motion. So after a while, um, so here's, here's the equilibrium and it's going up and down. Um, we can set a threshold where if it fluctuates up to this threshold, then um, there's a demon which is measuring the position, notices that it's hit the threshold and then raises the threshold in just the right amount to not do any work on the system. So intuitively, if the spring, if it's, if, if, if here's the, 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 the support, it fluctuates up, compresses the spring in a certain energy. We can move it to the place where the spring is stretched with just the same energy, okay? And so the energy has not changed, so we're not doing any work, but now the new equilibrium is higher, and so the, the particle will set up here, and then it eventually go to a new threshold and we can keep going up and up and up. And, and it kind of seems like we're raising this particle, we're lifting a heavy mass up, but we're not doing any work on it, right? Because it's just the thermal fluctuations that lift it, and then we just we, we, we respond in a way that doesn't do any work, the thermal fluctuations lift it, and respond. Yeah. So it looks like we're extracting energy from the bath and storing it like work. Um, and, <laughs> and of course, they, they repeat. Um, sorry, this is just saying what I was, I was saying. Um, and we have an experimental realization of this using optical tweezers, which are a sharply focused beam, of, 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 of a laser beam that's sharply focused and produces uh, a, a, a potential that is like a spring in all three directions. And if we have a <laughs> horizontal beam and a heavy particle, the particle is sagging in the beam and that's like the spring. And so we can look at the, the fluctuations up and then we raise, we move the beam up. And so that kind of does these operations that I just talked about. Um, so historically, well, okay, maybe first, let me just say, so I'm not gonna have too much uh, 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 about the experiment itself, but just to say that, that um, what's going on here? Oh, it's just slow. Um, uh, just to say that, that, that it's a fairly standard home-built optical tweezer setup. Um, we have um, uh, the, the trapping laser and something called an acousto-optic deflector that can rapidly change the beam position. Um, it, it then controls the position of a trap for a bead. There's gravity pulling it down. We have a, we have a separate laser that we use to measure it. Um, and we can control its intensity. Um, and uh, um, 
uh, and so the, the, the light sort of scatters off the bead and is recorded on this, this, I'm sorry, this kind of got all messed up here, but this should really, okay. Okay, things, things got a little messed up here that the, the FPGA is not really part of this, but, but it gets on a, onto a, um, a quadrant photodiode and then somewhere off to the side, there's a controller that is, that is you know, doing it, you know, taking information about the observations, deciding when to raise the and stuff. Um, and as a technical thing, the, 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 the um, loop rate here, where you go from, from detection to a, some calculation to do I, do I move up the support is going at 50 kilohertz, so 50,000 times a second. Um, that's actually very fast for a standard computer, so you need to use specialized hardware. You, you can't really do this on a standard computer, so you need some special hardware to carry out this control. Uh, the controller also moves the position of the laser, right? Yes. Yeah. So this this acoustic beam deflector, it's a little bit of a story about what it does, but basically it just you you, you can you can tell it you can give it a, a signal and it will change the direction of the beam, which can change the height of the beam that's, that, as as it goes through the uh, trap. And here's just a little picture snapshot of, of a piece of the experiment showing. The, the sample kind of in the center. There's there's an objective to uh, uh, focus the laser beam to create the trap, and then there's another objective with the other laser to observe it, which is converged less strongly, so it's a wider beam. Okay, so that's the experiment. Um, so normally, the question that people, the first question people ask is, okay, you're raising this thing up. Uh, uh, without doing any work, this seems to violate uh, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, what's going on. And there's a long story, which I won't get into for the moment, at least, about the cost of, I mean, the answer basically is that, that carrying out these measurements and the computations associated with it also implies some, some, some work that's required to do this. And that work will, when in the case of one temperature bath, uh, always exceed uh, uh, whatever you're getting from the extraction. So you can't win in this. There is a caveat to this that if somehow the bath is at a higher temperature than the measuring device, then you have two temperatures involved and then you can get work because um, you, you, you have more thermal fluctuations than the thermal fluctuations that are controlled in the normal costs. So in principle, that could give you something. But if everything is at one temperature the way I described, the best you could do would be to break even. And if you're doing your finite rate, you won't break even. Um, but it still might be interesting to understand what this can do. And that was sort of our, our starting point. So um, uh, the I guess one of the, the you know one of the main messages I wanted to get across was that that um, these are actually engines that at, at their scale can do significant things. And whereas the, the thought experiment that Maxwell proposed, you know, seemed like it was vanishing small amounts of, of energy. And it was relative to the large system that was being imagined that when you have a small system with fluctuations that the, the energies involved are, are actually significant. We'll see that. Um, okay, so um, this is our, our feedback algorithm. So this is kind of, the, you know, straightforward application of feedback where we have some some uh, uh, threshold uh, here, and if the, the 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 position of the particle x, I'm ignoring measurement noise for for a while. Um, if this position exceeds uh, uh, relative to the trap, so this is the displacement of the trap exceeds some some threshold amount, then we can raise it by some amount. Otherwise, we just sit and wait. So this is a kind of nonlinear feedback rule because um, this this uh, um, this condition here, I can put into like a step function and stuff. So it's you know any any kind where you have these sort of multiple hit, multiple paths is automatically not linear. Okay. Um, uh, however, um, uh, we can we can implement it, and so here's here's a beam, and, and we have a, a gain alpha which says how much should we raise it. Okay, and and. You know, the loose criterion is we want to raise it so that we're not doing any work on the particle, but we'll see how that that's uh, um, how that's met in a moment. The result of it is is sort of a, a little bit of a dance between the particle position and the trap position. So you can see that here's the particle position 
And every time it goes up enough, it hits some threshold and we raise the trap because the, that's the black line. Um, and so if it happens to go down and take a long excursion down, we do nothing for a long time until then it starts to go up again and we raise it. So it's kind of got this ratcheting uh, motion. Okay, so the first task is to figure out what value of alpha um, uh, that should be done so that uh, um, no work is done. The naive answer would be um, to, um, you know, if we fluctuated here, we displace the um, system so that it's, it, you know, the potential is just matched. And in our notation, this corresponds to a value of alpha equals two, basically one to get to here and one to get to here. Okay, so alpha equals two would be just kind of the naive thing that you do. But what if I just see what we do with the where it is with respect to that? And how much we're moving and so forth. And we find that, in fact, uh, in, in, in typical conditions, it might not be two, but 1.5. And um, one immediate reason is the kind of timing issues that, that uh, uh, Miguel's been alluding to, which is just that you know, there's a time delay between the time you measure it and the time you can respond to, to move it. And it's very small, but it's, you know, it's small, but it's not negligible. In fact, we set it in this experiment to be one of the... So... We're actually observing it at time k, but moving it at time k learn how to deal with when you're doing this. But but one of the effects, so so that's this is partially to blame uh, um, for why this is why this is lower because you know in the time that it takes it's sliding down and so you shouldn't go as far you should go like here. Um, as we'll see this 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 turns out to explain part of what's going on but not all but we'll we'll, we'll see the rest of it in, in in a little bit. Okay so we empirically tune it to the value of alpha that, that makes this work. And then we have this ratcheting going up like this. So um, we were interested in how to maximize the power that's being extracted. So there's work extracted in, in raising a weight. And if it's, if it's on average going up at some constant velocity, there's power being extracted, rate of free energy extraction, so on. Um, so, so we would like to maximize this. And so we play around with parameters. Um, one is the sampling frequency. So how often do we make these measurements? This 50,000 times a second relative to a kind of natural time scale of the system, which is- Another frequency, the corner frequency. Which is the corner frequency. Yeah, we've done optical tweezers. It's the corner frequency of the trap. But basically, you've got a big particle moving in a viscous fluid. It's over damped. And so there's a time scale for it to relax when it's, when it's brought away from equilibrium. It just relaxes exponentially with the time constant. And that's- that's set by things like the viscosity of the fluid, the size of the particle, the strength of the laser, and so forth. But again, it can be measured. And so that defines um, a time scale or a frequency scale. And you can ask, how does the frequency of measurements compare to the frequency of this trap, for example? And so that's what we did here. This is the sampling frequency in those units. And what you see is that um, initially, the, the rate of free energy extraction or power, loosely the power, is going up with the sampling frequency uh, linear, actually. And then it saturates once you get well past one. So one is the sampling frequency is equal to the trap frequency. Um, by the time you've hit 10 or 100, it's pretty well flat. And what this means is that out of all the fluctuations, you know, there's there's 10 to the 23 water molecules in this bath, and there are 10 to the 23 modes of fluctuation. Um, but the ones that are useful for energy extraction are only the low frequency ones that, that the trap sees. The trap can only respond to, to perturbations uh, at or below the trap frequency. The ones above are just sort of averaged out and, and, and don't make the particle move, so we can't exploit them to, to get work. So most of the modes in some sense in the bath are not relevant. And there's a few low frequency modes that, that, that are producing these fluctuations that we take advantage of. Okay, um, so, so the first lesson is you want to sample 
faster, if you can, faster than the um, uh, uh, trap frequency. Um, but there's a point of diminishing returns. Uh, the second one is where is the threshold? And so this is the threshold for as it, as it moves the, the, the trap. And um, uh, what we see here is that the power that we get is increasing and then in some sense saturates or comes, but it, but it increases to zero threshold. So in some sense, every fluctuation up, you know, every fluctuation where the spring is starting to be compressed, you want to take advantage of. Okay. Now, one subtlety is that it's hanging naturally because of its weight below the equilibrium. So I'm talking about it first set, so when you talk about zero threshold, it still has to go a finite distance to kind of get rid of the gravitational side, and then it's, does it compress the spring after that? Like gravity is naturally stretching it, but the moment it starts to compress it, that's when you want to uh, ratchet. Um, sorry, John, you are measuring uh, the free energy changes with the sampling frequency and the threshold, right? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so, so the sampling frequency, we want to make it fast, okay. and the threshold we want to set to zero, where zero though is, 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 is what I was just saying. That is, it's in some, it's, yes. I mean, it's, it is time. zero in the sense that every, you know, as you what will happen then is that- Always going up. It's, it's always kind of going up, except that if it makes a big sag and goes down, mm -hmm. then you spend a long time kind of being stretched and then have to come back up to the compressed space. The moment it starts to get compressed, we, we, for every up fluctuation beyond that, beyond that sort of neutral kind of spring, you want to take advantage of. Oh, wait, they do Okay. Um, so you can do this with different uh, um, laser powers. And so you can see that the, the, the stronger the laser, the bigger the spring, the stiffer the spring constant, the more you get. So this is kind of a physical limitation. And I would say that this is analogous to when you make an engine, what are you making it of? You know, are you making it out of plastic? Are you making it out of metal or tungsten? You know, something, something special. There's, there's, there's the material properties of it, which is in this case the spring, like how stiff the spring. So the, the stiffer the spring, in some sense, the better. Um, but, but in our case, a stiffer spring means a bigger laser, and so there's only so much that we can, we can go. So, so, but anyway, but, but to the extent that you can, more is better. Um, you can do this with um, uh, different bead sizes. So this is a, a one and a half micron bead. This is a three micron bead and a five micron bead. And um, you can see that if, just in terms of, of, of getting to the most power, we get to about roughly about a thousand kT per second. And as I said, this is a significant uh, thing. It's comparable to what a, a motor inside a cell would uh, uh, be putting out in terms of powers. So these are on their own scale a significant amount of power. Um, uh, you can also ask um, if I just care about the speed, you know, how fast it's going, um, what should I do? And so then it turns out that so so bigger beads were nice for, for power extraction because they're heavier. Okay. A smaller bead goes faster. And so you can see that this is the big B, this is five, three, one and a half, we even um, went to one half here. Um, and so, they, so the faster, the smaller the B, the less drag there is, the faster it can go. Uh, the straight, this is a straight line here, the, this experiment either going up, but you can also go horizontally. And so we can distinguish uh, uh, what's, what's from gravity and what's, what's uh, from, from drag. Um, so again, speeds 190 microns per second. This is this is like a very very fast bacterium. Like e. coli is about 20 microns per second. Um, so again, at their own scale, the micron scale and so forth of the bacterium, these 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 are competitors. And uh, have you mentioned the velocity with uh, an average from the position in one time instant? Yeah, these are these are long time averages. So yeah, obviously the, the the instantaneous velocity is all over. The place. Yeah, but you already mentioned the position, no? Yeah, you only measure the position. But this is just over a long period. They are the average. The average time temporal average. Yeah, with many, many ratchet events. Uh, uh, okay. Um, Okay, and so then there's a there's a, there's some nice theoretical analysis of it, which I will mostly um, not talk about. But but um, you can you can treat this as a first passage 
problem. And say, for example, if I start from minus xt and go to plus xt, where xt is the threshold, what is the time, how long does it take to first go here? Because when it comes up here, we ratchet and kind of reset the problem. So it really maps on to the passage time. And, and there's a classic result that's almost 100 years old for the mean first passage time going back to actually the same country agent from optimal control, um, but doing work 25 years earlier in, in uh, on, on this, um, and so so we can we can do this calculation and, and and even come up with an analytic expression for what the velocity should be in the maximum time in terms of things like the buoyant mass. And this delta g is the distance that it that bring sags because of the heavy particle in the gravitational field measured relative to the standard deviation of fluctuations in the spring, which is kind of an actual oh, length scale. Oh, right. um, and so you can take all of our experimental results that I was showing and more uh, for velocity and power extraction. And using this theory, it tells you what, what are the nice variables to plot. And so you can collapse all of these curves oh. onto one, collapse all of these curves on a oh. single curve, where here we're, we're using the reduced mass, which is this you know, the buoyant mass times gravity over the spring constant and then its equilibrium width. And then the time scale is in terms of the relax. So, so this is the sigma is the, 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 the width of fluctuations. Tau r is the time scale to relax. And then kt is the dimensional spots that, that collapse all of these separate curves on, onto one. OK, so, so we know something now about how to kind of maximize the performance, we were then interested in what are the effects of noise on the measurement. So we've assumed so far that the measurements um, are, are um, sufficiently precise that we don't have to worry about the difference between the measured value. Um, but uh, if we go back to our, um, uh, back to our, uh, um, set up with the, the um, uh, uh, detection laser and so forth, we can, we can certainly use this um, uh, device here to, to, re to, to reduce the intensity of the laser and use just a very new beam. And the amount of measurement noise increases if the intensity of the laser goes down. That's fairly, fairly clear and traces to shot noise. Um, and why might you want to do this? Well, there's some practical things. If you were working with, um, instead of light scattering, fluorescent molecules, they can photo bleach. And in general, organisms don't like to be blasted with various laser light. So you want to minimize the intensity of, of, uh, 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 of your illumination. And um, anyway, so there, 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 there are reasons that you would, would actually not want to have too precise a measurement. Also, if we start to get to calculating efficiencies, there are information costs for, for, for acquiring very precise information, but I'm not gonna go there for, for now. Okay. Um, so, um, so, 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 so now varying the um, noise or what I'll call the signal to noise ratio. So the, the signal here is the amount that the bead would naturally move, which is the sigma and the noise would be the standard deviation of uncertainty of the measurements. And so their ratio is, a, is what I'll call a signal to noise ratio. Um, and, and the observation that, that, that we found was that this information engine stops working when the signal to noise ratio gets too bad or the noise gets too high. And let me just trace through that. So if the signal to noise ratio is relatively high, we have the situation that we described before where we would um, tune this value of alpha and you know naively we thought it should be two but we found somewhere around say 1.5 uh, uh, it was you know we, we could tune it to so that the trap is is, is not you know as, as we move the trap up each time we're doing it on average we're not we're not doing any work on the system okay, so we adjust the value of alpha and empirically measure the 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 the, 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 the work that the trap is doing, uh, uh, signal to noise, this is not a problem, but uh, we can do this now as a function of the signal to noise. 
And what we find is that as we go to higher and higher signals of noise, it goes not to two, but to, to 1.8. Okay, so that's one question. But perhaps more relevant here is that it goes down and I don't know if you can see, you, know, you can't really see this very well, but I, I was using filled circles here. And then over here, these are all hollow circles. And what the hollow circles mean is that we actually weren't able to find any non-zero alpha that would, that would um, uh, make the trap work equal to zero. Now, basically, we had to set it equal to, when, I mean, if, if you set alpha equals zero, then you're not ratcheting at all. So you're not moving the trap, so you know you're not doing any work. So that's always an option. Um, the question is, can you set it to some non-zero value that you can measure a crossover between doing negative work and positive work? And so it got so small that we couldn't do that. So it seems to kind of, you know, just it just goes away. So this, um, the fact that it doesn't go up to two, you can actually show that this is traceable to the delay in the system. So now we see that there's actually two reasons that alpha is not two. One of them has to do with the delay. And when I talked about that, that you see the particles and um, you respond to it a short time afterwards. Okay, but clearly this is not even the biggest part of things once you get down to here. That, that somehow the, 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 the noise is, is causing problems um, in this as well. And so we want to try to understand what's with the noise on the measurement. This is noise on the measurement. Yeah, yeah, of course, there's always thermal fluctuations. Um, but as I said, that's kind of our signal. Yes. Okay, so one of the questions, you know, is, is what's going on here? Is the alpha just, you know, very, very small and, and, and we didn't have the experimental resolution to measure it, or is it? Is it actually zero? And um, I want to claim that we can show that it's actually zero and that there's a kind of phase transition between this engine working and it's not working. Um, and the way that we do this is to um, measure, this is the, the, um, the power as a function of, of alpha. Um, so this is, this is for the trap. Okay, so this is the this is the the work done per time by the by the trap um, as a function of alpha for very very small values of alpha here um, that that uh, uh, Tushar was able to measure um, for various signal to noise ratios. So the signal to noise ratio is encoded in the gray level from about 0.4 here to six here. Um, so what you can see is that when it's high, this this goes this is negative, and then we'll eventually. Uh, we'll show in a moment, um, comes back up and becomes positive. And when it becomes positive, that's the solution that we're taking. Um, but you can see that here, for example, it never becomes negative. It just goes goes up. And if you if you take the linear coefficient of it coming into zero and plot the linear coefficient versus it with noise, one can really see that there's a, a transition at a finite signal to noise ratio where um, the, 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 the slope is, is going from positive to negative. So when it's negative, that means it's going down and will eventually come up and we can define um, a, a non-zero value of alpha that makes the, the trap work zero. But when it's positive, then clearly you can't, right? It's, it's only zero at, at zero, which means you're not raising the trap. And the fact that it happens at a finite signal to noise ratio tells us that this is actually a phase transition, uh, that there are two, qualitatively different regimes separated by some non-analytic behavior. And um, so, so what this means in terms of the um, uh, gravitational energy extraction, um, we, we measure as a function of signal to noise. And so, so, so this is the, the value that we can calculate um, neglecting any noise. And so for high signal to noise ratio, we match that, but then it starts to go down, but at a certain point, it goes down, and again, I'm using hollow ones to say that basically we just set it equal to zero, and these are just kind of zero with fluctuations. Um, and whereas this just looked to be like a, a continuous decrease, we can actually see from all the, the this is simulations that Joseph did that, that this really is a kind of non analytic feature here where we're coming in at some finite slope. Oh, and I just lost, I think I just lost this. Yes. Okay. 
Oh, I know it's just kind of frozen here. Let's see. I think I have to rejoin. Maybe I'm not sure. Sorry. Try. Try to join. Thank <laughs> you. 